You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. I am your host, Bill Powers. And joining me today is Joe Mazumdar of ExplorationInsights.com, one of the top newsletter writers in the resource sector. Joe, thanks for coming back on the show for your quarterly check-in. And my question for you is one that I've been asking several people as I survey investing in possible developers or mine constructors in, in the in, in the mining space. You know, I look at the inflationary times that we're in. And I'm wondering how to value these projects and wondering if the CapEx is even going to be met. What are your thoughts about investing in a developer or a mine constructor at this point in time? Hey, Bill. Thanks again for the invite. Yeah. So with respect to developers, um, you know, we, we have seen cost inflation everywhere and people are seeing inflation, you know, in terms of their groceries and everything like that. Shipping is an issue. Labor is an issue. Now energy is an issue. And like uh, I would look, take an example like Cote Lake that I am gold is building. So we're seeing several big open pit mines being developed in uh, in Northern Ontario, which include Cote Lake, uh, Magino for Argonaut, Hard Rock for, for Equinox. And, you know, uh, this development has to happen, you know, because if we look at production profiles of known deposits, you know, the estimates by some pundits is like we could have a 40 to 45 percent drop in annual production in uh, gold production uh, mined uh, over the next decade. So we're going to have to replace that. And so some of these projects need to get built. Um, and, and then if we look at something like Detour, which, you know, had all its issues, but, you know, it's it's a large project. It's like uh, 21 million tons a year. Its head grade's about 0. 0.8, 0. 0.9. But Kirkland's making a lot of money out of it now at, the, at these gold prices. You know, um, Cote is around one gram. Uh, Hard Rock is around 1.3, and I think uh, Magino's 0.8, 0.9. So these are sort of on the edge with respect to grade, large open pit projects, but exposed to cheap power, usually hydro. The problem is, uh, you know, when you look at the feasibility studies between doing the original feasibility study that you use as the basis for the permit, going through permitting, which is not always, a, not usually an issue in Northern Ontario. You know, that might take you 18 months to two years. Then you build it and you build it based on that feasibility study, which you might want to actually update that feasibility study. But the problem is when you update the feasibility study, you got to put in a new technical report and that might trigger another event. And then maybe on the permitting cycle, they won't like that. And so usually that documents all anybody has to look at. And so if we compare that number to what Cote Lake revised July estimate, that's about 30% higher. And so on a 100% basis, because uh, I am Gold owns about 70% of it, it's now a $1.6 billion US project. So um, so if you were an investor in I am Gold and this is their big major project, uh, yeah, that would be a worry. That would be a concern. Uh, so it's, it's almost best to sell them on the permitting and then come back when it's, you know, commercial or, or in production after all the hiccups, because we know like a detour also had a lot of hiccups, but once it got steady state, you know, it started generating free cash flow with the rise in gold price, but, you know, uh, don't deceive yourselves, but these kind of projects require a, your, your idea that the gold price will continue to be, to continue to be high. But we also got the issue of COVID restrictions and, and, and the ability to get labor and, and freight, which also adds, uh, you know, uh, costs. Before, when we had the super cycle and everybody was building, everybody was competing for that labor. It's different now. It's not as many projects are getting built, but there's less labor to compete for. And that's what's driving up some of the costs with respect to resources. So in those long lead time items, right? Like you're ordering a, a ball mill from China. Yeah. Like you think, oh, we'll be in production in 18 months. Well, you might not get that thing for three years. I mean, there's factors like this at play too, isn't there? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about three years, but definitely like months. And when 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 it becomes like if you look at what they call a Gantt chart, and that's a very important thing to look at. And if I'm looking at a development company, that's why I look at what what's the critical path. And so if you know, if let's say the ball mill or earthworks or uh, you know, putting the concrete lay down, you know, whatever, something there is critical. That's the one I'm eyeing in and saying, okay, because that one, a whole bunch of other things can only happen until that thing is done. And if that thing's not done, everything else gets delayed and you're paying people just to sit on their hands. And that's when you start getting a little bit of cost creep, you know, in terms of your schedule. Uh, and what I've seen like in West Africa, like what in terms of uh, Bombori with, with Orzone, I had a meeting with them and they seem to be pretty confident that they will get in on their budget and on time. And so some of these cost pressures we see may be regional and, and not, uh, not global. You know, there, there might be cost inflation for some specific items that they're ordering, but they might not have the labor inflation that, that we're seeing in, in, in Canada or, you know, Western Australia or something like that. Joe, a recent guest said in terms of developers and mine constructors to be wary of big open pit projects because of the cost of energy. Would that be a concern you would have as well? Well, it, it depends what the cost of energy is. It's, if it's remote and it's energy related to oil, gas, natural gas, yeah, that that could uh, that could definitely escalate. Uh, but if it's hydropower, I, you know, which is a lot of the Northern Ontario stuff, stuff in British Columbia, stuff in Quebec, potentially less, you know, and, and that's why they build the big, you know, 13 to 20 million ton per year processing plants in, in these places, because other places, they just would not make any economic sense. Uh, you know, and that's, you know, if you look at a huge project like, uh, like Donlin Creek, I mean, you know, a million ounces potentially, I believe, a year is what the feasibility study says. But I mean, the power required there, and it's remote, that would require, that would be exposed definitely to um, uh, to your previous guest's idea about, hey, watch out for these big open pit mines. That's definitely one that would uh, be exposed to that kind of uh, inflation. So if you're advising sell after the permit is issued, and then buy back after commercial production, isn't like that the antithesis of that golden runway we always talk about in that year leading up to production. So you're saying avoid yeah. the golden runway? <laughs> well, the thing is that you, I, I guess you got to be a little bit more specific. So my, my answer might be a bit glib, but a specific projects may have um, uh, different issues. And some of them with protracted timelines might be more exposed to labor escalation, to um, yeah, other, other problems with respect to their Gantt chart. The more complicated, the more uh, likely cost inflation. The more remote, the more likely cost inflation. You know, uh, like if we take that project in West Africa, like Mombori, a, a tighter project uh, with less exposure that's that's purchased a lot of the long lead items. You know, even when you purchase the long lead items, getting them is the other question. Transportation, and, right? <laughs> yeah, that's huge right now, obviously. Uh, anything in a container is at risk. So that's another risk that, uh, that you know, uh, that, that could delay you know, commercial production. And the, and, the, and the further you delay commercial production, that's all the cash that you're spending, not making any money. And then you got to pay back debt or private equity or, you know, start putting up a stream or start making interest payments, you know, and then that attacks your working capital, forcing you potentially to go back to the market when the market knows you're coming. That's something you really want to avoid. Most people that know what they're doing build up significant working capital facilities to take into account. But we are in, you know, sort of uncharted territory with respect to the risks we're seeing now that are, you know, somewhat COVID related, but the economy picking up at the same time, you know, ports are congested. We don't have truck drivers to, you know, at the port facilities everything is sort of delayed. And uh, so uh, those are issues that would impact bigger projects more so than smaller projects. So with all these risks and threats to an investment, a royalty company makes a lot of sense at this point too, as we're discussing this, right? Yeah. I mean, 
if we take a step back, you know, yes, on royalty, but but if we take a step back on development, you know, we come back to the fact that, you know, the world still needs, you know, these certain metals or copper, palladium, whatever projects. And so they have to be built. But in the in the interim, there might be some pain. If you're a long term investor, you know, you might be able to just move through it. If you're somebody who likes to trade, that might be advice to trade. With respect to a royalty company, you're absolutely right. I mean, the whole idea there is that you do not have exposure to the cost of inflation, but you want to make sure that the royalty is on something that the cost of inflation might not put the underlying asset out of business. You know, uh, but yeah, definitely royalty companies right now with respect to you know, cost inflation and creep might be something uh, to consider. Torque Resources is an exploration company establishing a portfolio of premier copper gold early stage projects in Chile. Torque's management and technical teams have a strong track record of raising capital, discovery, and monetization of exploration successes. The company's Margarita Copper Gold project is located within the prolific coastal Cordillera Belt in Chile, which hosts some of the world's largest and most profitable copper mines. The Margarita project possesses excellent discovery potential for a major copper discovery due to the strength of the alteration system, large-scale magnetic targets, and the presence of copper oxide mineralization. Drilling is anticipated to begin in Q3 of this year. Torque trades in Canada under TORQ and on the OTC under TRBMF. To learn more, go to torqueresources.com. That's torqueresources.com. So we've seen m and Agnico Eagle is buying Kirkland Lake. Do you like this deal? It makes sense. I mean, because Kirkland, uh, like a lot of companies that have really high margin assets, anything that they would get involved with would be dilutive almost. And I think Kirkland wanted to keep its sort of uh, the investment thesis that people went into Kirkland for, you know, high margin assets, low geopolitical jurisdictions, great balance sheet you know, uh, that sort of thing. And then, you know, it turned out that Agnico was the only one that was trying to do a similar thing because geopolitically, it's mostly Canada and Finland. Um, and, and also they have high margin assets. Uh, they're both based in Toronto. Um, uh, you know, balance sheet wise, Agnico was not as good as, as Kirkland, which had no debt and a lot of cash. So that definitely helped Kirkland share, uh, Agnico shareholders. The other thing that helped Agnico shareholders was the size of Detour and the additional 10 million ounces they added of MNI, granted at 0.8 grams. So that was a boon to Agnico. Um, so having and so then them selling themselves is now, hey, look, generalist investor, I'm now one of the top three. But hey, I don't have, let's say, Africa. I don't have Russia. I don't have all these other or, or even Latin America. I'm just these sort of places that if you want that kind of exposure, I can give you that. And I give you high margin assets. I give you a great balance sheet, you know blah, 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 dual listed. And so for those specific generalists that might not like Barrick's exposure to Africa or Newmont's exposure to Latin America, what have you, you know, Agnico could, you know, fit into a bit of a niche among the rarefied space of uh, the senior pre gold producers. And then we also saw Calibre picking up Fiore in Nevada. Do you like that transaction? Well, I mean, the thing is with with, with Calibre, uh, you know, they're all Nicaragua. Um, they've effectively implemented their hub and spoke model of, you know, basically feeding an underutilized plant as opposed to building a plant closer uh, to uh, to this high grade deposit that they were permitting. And so for them, they've successfully implemented that uh, that plan. But I think that discount for Nicaragua would continue. So getting something outside that jurisdiction, even if it's like 50,000 years of heat bleach, they they might have another 50,000 ounces of heat bleach with another deposit. So the pan is the one that's operating. And I think it's uh, gold rock that's got a scoping study on it. So they might in the future be able to add about 50 to 100,000 ounces, depending how much pan has got left. And they get a footprint in uh, in uh, in Nevada, and they could sort of sell themselves on that. I, I think the big thing about uh, um, 
Calibre, which a lot of these guys don't have, is a really good uh, CEO who's managed portfolio of assets for Newmont. And, and I've known Darren Hall for a while and he's, he's top, uh, you know, he's a great guy and really knows how to implement, you know, a big company sort of uh, methodology to a junior company. He did that when he joined uh, them uh, with New Market uh, and his ability to manage all the assets basically allowed the, the mine team at Fosterville to basically find the high grade mineralization that was different than what they were actually producing at the time. So, yeah, I, I think it's a great management team. I think it's a good move for uh, for uh, Calibre to to you know, get that diversification of jurisdiction. And for Fiore, I don't think management's idea was to, they were always probably in it to, uh, to sell. I mean, they only owned 1% of the company, I think the insiders. Um, so yeah. And, and the shareholders get a 30% kick. I, I don't know if a lot of the people that might've bought uh, Fiore for, for, you know, Hey, it's in Nevada would be interested in the exposure to Nicaragua. You can maybe see some of those people selling, uh, as the traction action uh, goes through. Uh, but I'm sure from a Calibre shareholder point of view, uh, they probably would like or should like uh, the diversification from, for, from Nevada. And we saw good news out of Peru last week with uh, Bear Creek Mining's uh, Karani project getting local approval. And also Castillo said he supports it if the local community does. Uh, what's your commentary here? I think that it's a couple of positives there. Like Bear Creek, I think the original approvals were granted like in 2018 for the project, which which is uh, Karani. So Karani is like uh, 225 million ounces of silver grading about 50 grams in an open pit. And these are reserves. It's been sitting there for a while. Uh, it's got also lead and zinc. Uh, but importantly, uh, Castillo is showing the investment community that, hey, if the locals in your area approve the project and, you know, social license wise, you know, I'm not going to stand in the way. And, and basically the locals came there October 15th to the presidential palace and basically stated their case that, hey, we want this project to be built. And then he's supporting that. You know, I was under the impression that, uh, you know, some of the issues were more downstream of where Karani was towards, you know, Lake Titicaca and the Aymar Indians down there. I don't know if they were part of the team that went there to present their case October 15th. Uh, but obviously the company's uh, stoked about it. The investors are stoked about it. So, um, yeah, um, it's, it's definitely positive for investing in Peru. If you've got a project with a management team that's been in Peru that has local support, you know, uh, that's the, that project in this environment, even with this left wing guy, could still be done. And so, uh, you know, there, there, there's room for, uh, for uh, improvement in Peru. And on the other hand, you got local communities wanting to blockade Las Bombas copper mine at the same time, right? So you just basically have to get your pulse on what's going on at the local level if you're going to invest yeah. in Peru. But but that's 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 the case everywhere. I mean, it could be Arizona, it could be you know West Africa, it could be Australia. It, it, it's not just Peru. That that that, that idea that uh, that permitting and all the social license to operate is local. That's been the thing for more than a decade. You mean you can have problems in Minnesota? <laughs> Believe it or not. And Michigan, where I live too. <laughs> so. Yeah, Minnesota, yeah. Michigan, Arizona. Um, I mean, when I worked for Phelps Dodge, I think it took us 10 years to uh, permit uh, the Safford SXCW mine and by the time we permitted it, I think the copper market went into a different cycle and such that they didn't build it right away. But yeah, California, let's not even talk about that, you know, <laughs> and so most of the Northwest Pacific. Uh, and so there's really only a few places, even in the States, that people say, oh, hey, this is a great jurisdiction that 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 actually make any sense, that, that have a history of, of permitting things and bringing things into production quickly, and hence why they get the premium. And hence why a lot of, you know, big companies, gold companies are looking more at British Columbia, looking more at Ontario and Quebec and these places where they can permit easier. 
You know, if you can find something anywhere in the world that the locals are okay with and and make economic sense, you know, that's the government's not going to stop you. I don't think. Uh, and and the fact that the president, uh, you know, Castillo is saying that, you know, he's online if if they're okay with it is great. Because uh, then he's not coming over the top of them and saying, no, we're not going to have any development. We hate mining sort of thing. I think as soon as you become president of Peru, you realize that the GDP is driven by mining. And if you, you know, like are very negative on mining, you're, you know, cutting your nose to spite your face. Uh, and you better get on. You better get on the train. But if there's a significant opposition to the project, those are the people that voted for him. So I don't think there's any way he's going to go over top of them and say, "No, I'm going to shove this project down your throat." Uh, I think that's going to be harder to do. That makes a lot of sense. Well, could we conclude with maybe a recent investment or a stock you think has good potential in the short term? Well, in terms of royalties, I did do uh, part of, I, I told my subscribers as well, I did. I took a piece of uh, EMX royalties, uh, Royalty Corp. Uh, and the reason for that is that they have uh, uh, several royalties that are actually going to be cash flowing. Um, so uh, they bought SSRM, SSR Mining's uh, portfolio in Turkey, and some of these projects are coming into production now. And then they also got Chikaro Pechi, which is uh, Zijin Mining, uh, you know, are basically breaking ground on that uh, high sulfidation epithermal copper gold deposit in Serbia. They bought an operating royalty on a porphyry copper gold project in Chile, Casabrones. So I expect a big increase in their cash flow over the next two to three years. And then they've got several other development projects coming in from Turkey uh, beyond that. And I think they will continue to be active in the space with respect to, uh, you know, globally uh, in terms of what they're already doing. So yeah, th that's one I've, I've added recently. So you would say that that future cash flow is not built into the share price right now? That expectation. Yeah, yeah, that, that's my whole uh, idea right now is that it's not built in yet. And, and so they would go from being, you know, a royalty generator to being an actual cash flowing royalty company. And, and I would say, like, this is not a recent purchase, but origin royalties that I've owned for a while, that's coming into the same space because their royalty on Irma Tanya, which First Majestic is putting into play, that will be cash flowing. And I don't think that their current market cap is taking that into account. And also that they have a royalty on the silicon project that Angle Gold are talking up. Then at the same time, when we talked about Bear Creek getting Karani, you know, we hear about Cabradona basically getting pushed back a bit in, in Colombia. And that, that's another big open pit copper gold porphyry deposit. And so again, local matters. Well, you gave two stock picks. And if you want more of Joe's stock picks that are uh, very well-informed, thoroughly thought through picks, go to explorationinsights.com. And he also writes periodic educational articles. So minimally go there to read his articles, but also check out the subscription service. Joe, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for checking in. Thanks again, Bill.